that means that uh, I will try to be uh, a little bit less understandable, okay? Uh, so we were talking about uh, Floquet states, and I remind you that there was so so many things has has been said have been said uh, between the previous lecture and this lecture. So let me remind you what uh, quasi energy states are, what Floquet Floquet states are. We have a Hamiltonian which is periodic in time. And we look for the wave functions, which, when we increment time by the period of the Hamiltonian, they acquire a phase factor, uh, which is determined by the value epsilon. And epsilon is called, is called the quasi-energy or the Floquet eigenvalue. Now, I must say that uh, the term Floquet eigenvalue is used in completely different context. Uh, in, in the theory of dynamical systems, and therefore I prefer to, to call it uh, quasi-energy because this is this should not this should not uh, lead, lead to any confusion. And then, what were the steps that we made to arrive to our effective Hamiltonian of the dapping oscillator? We started with this periodic Hamiltonian, which had this form 1 half p squared plus 1 half omega naught squared q squared plus 1 quarter gamma q to the fourth minus q f cosine omega f t. We consider the case where omega f was close to the eigenfrequency so that absolute value of delta omega was much less than omega f. And we used the rotation wave approximation. But we did it in two steps. We first made a canonical transformation. And then we did rescaling. The canonical transformation essentially tells us that the Hamiltonian at which we arrived, which had uh, this form. Uh, and minus b to the one half q, that this Hamiltonian has a complete set of eigenvalues. This is a Hermitian Hamiltonian, and we have uh, heard these words that Hermitian Hamiltonian has a complete uh, has a has a, the eigenvalues and eigen functions of the Hermitian Hamiltonian are orthogonal. The eigenvalues are real. And uh, because we were making a set of canonical transformations, we expect that they form a full uh, set. And I will not be proving this. But what is important is the following thing, that if we are talking about a harmonic oscillator, we use a Floquet state of a harmonic oscillator. And we use Floquet state of the harmonic oscillator, which has frequency not omega naught, but omega f. So Fox states of a harmonic oscillator with frequency omega f. And these states are defined as eigenstates of the raising and lowering operator. <clears throat> and this, uh, this set of states we know is uh, orthogonal and complete. Now we have found the eigenstates of the operator G which have the property that g psi g is equal to uh, psi g n, g n psi g n. These are eigenstates of the operator g. So in this rotating frame, we have a Hamiltonian, which is not a sum of the kinetic and potential energy. But it's still a Hamiltonian. It's fine. 
where it has uh, eigenfunctions, it has eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues form uh, are orthogonal, eigenfunctions, excuse me, are orthogonal. And what I can do, I can write this eigenfunction, psi gn, as a sum of eigenvector n. That is, I expand my eigenfunction of the oscillator in the rotating frame of this Hamiltonian. I expand it in the eigenfunctions of the oscillator with frequency omega f. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just a formal operation. This is a purely formal operation. And this is like you expand, you have a vector. And you say that this vector is a sum of these basis vectors with certain coefficients. And essentially, these Fock states, they provide a set of vectors in the Hilbert space. And we expand our eigenvector of the operator G in these states. And there is one-to-one -one correspondence between these functions and these functions. Both sets are complete and orthogonal. This must be familiar to you already after lectures today. <clears throat> And so far, so good. Uh, this, by the way, well, I'll come back. I'll, I'll come later to this. Uh, the interesting thing that comes from uh, this representation emerges once we start talking about relaxation. So let's think for a second about the way operator oscillator decays in Fox state. So this uh, states n equal to 0. This is state 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now I put along with this states of the eigenstates of operator Gn. And this is psi 0, psi 1, psi 2, and so on. The standard dissipation of the oscillator that we were using when we were de describing decay of the oscillator, where does it come from? It comes from the coupling of the oscillator to a thermal reservoir, for example, from emission of photons. You couple an oscillator to the electromagnetic field, and an oscillator can emit a photon and make a transition between the levels. Uh, more generally, it can emit phonons. It can uh, excite electron-hole pairs. There are many ways an electron can give energy and exchange energy with a the thermal reservoir. Uh, this is probably familiar to you, although sometimes it is kind of uh, hidden under the rug that relaxation is a microscopic process. Uh, the other name for it is back action, uh, and probably for many people in the audience, the word back action is more familiar than relaxation. But essentially, one way or the other, what happens is you couple your oscillator to a system. This oscillator perturbs the system. The system doesn't like it. It hits back. And when it hits back, it takes energy away from the oscillator, or it can give energy to the oscillator. What is the result of this energy exchange? 
Well, my oscillator can emit a photon and go down, or it can absorb a photon and go up. I will be talking about absorption and emission of photons because this is probably the most familiar uh, mechanism, but I can as well, as I said, any, any coupling to, uh, it can be two, two photons or two phonons or whatever. The specific mechanism depends on a system. So in nanomechanical systems, if you are talking about nanomechanical modes, these modes can decay, usually the important mechanism is decay into phonons, and then these phonons propagate through the, through the connection of the system to, to, to something, to the support. It go into, these phonons go into support and disappear. So this is one of the mechanisms of decay of nanomechanical modes. Uh, another mechanism is uh, there is current generated by these uh, vibrations of a nanomechanical system. But this current, again, it's essentially the creation of electron hole pair, excitation of electron hole pairs. And these electrons and holes, they, they go away, uh, just current and resistors, it's dissipation. Uh, so there are many mechanisms of relaxations, and essentially identifying these mechanisms is one of the important and uh, sometimes critical problems of uh, nanomechanical and micromechanical systems. Essentially, when you are talking about high Q systems, these are systems where you have managed to suppress these dissipation processes to make a support such that there is huge mismatch of, of the resistances and therefore phonons don't propagate into, into the support. You can uh, isolate them from, uh, from uh, resistors. You can make lifetime long, but you cannot make it infinite, no matter how hard you try. And what happens as a result of this process? So uh, an oscillator can make a transition here, can make a transition between these states and maybe up there. The transitions go both ways. It can emit excitations in the thermal reservoir, and it can absorb excitations from the thermal reservoir. As a result of these transitions, ultimately, when you have prepared an oscillator and you don't drive it, the oscillator comes to, if your bus is in thermal equilibrium, the oscillator comes also to thermal equilibrium. And the probability to find a system in a state N is proportional to e to the minus E N over K B T and the way we are considering an oscillator with frequency omega f, E n is h bar omega f n. And if you want, you put here the partition function to, to make sure that your oscillator has come to thermal equilibrium. Now, how does this thermal equilibrium form? How is it formed on, at the microscopic level? The critical thing for systems in thermal equilibrium is the condition of detailed balance. And this is also sometimes uh, not properly defined. So let me try to define it in this context. So my oscillator is in state N, and it can go from state N to state M. What I drew is uh, it goes to neighboring states. So M is N plus 1 or N minus 1. It's not necessarily nearest state. It can go over two levels or over three levels. It, it depends on the microscopic mechanism of relaxation. It can also come from state M to state N. So as I draw here, the oscillator can go from state 2 to state 1. If it is coupling to photons, it emits a photon. But then it can absorb a photon if it is in state 1 and go to state 2. 
world can emit a pair of photons and go from state one to state three, if the coupling allows processes like that. Now we leave the system alone, and it comes to thermal equilibrium. But first, it comes to what we say a stationary state. A stationary state means that if I look at a given state, there is a total probability to leave this state. And if I call the population of state n rho n, then there is a total probability to leave this state. And so I can write the equation for the population of this state, which will be minus sum over m, w n to m rho n. There is also a total probability to come back to this state from all other states. So this is an influx term. And of course, m is not equal to n, and m is not equal to n here. The stationary regime means that rho n dot is equal to 0. Does it mean that our system is in thermal equilibrium? Does it mean thermal equilibrium? Yes. No, it does not. It does not. It means that we have a stationary state, but it does not mean that it is in thermal equilibrium. Now, in systems in thermal equilibrium, uh, there is time reversibility of all processes. You inverse time, and nothing happens. That is, if I have a transition from state N to state M, I inverse time, it will be a transition from state M to state N, if I look backward in time. And the property of thermal equilibrium is the detailed balance, the, the total probability of transitions between any pairs of states. What I wrote here is that the total probability to leave these states and go anywhere is equal to the total probability to come to these states from anywhere. Detailed balance means that for any pair of states, the probability to go from one to the other is equal to the probability to go in the opposite direction. So if I say that WNM rho n is equal to w m n rho m. That is, each transition is balanced. And this property is satisfied in thermal equilibrium. Now what we have from here is that we know that w n m over w m n is uh, rho n over rho m. And since we know the Boltzmann factor for this uh, no, 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 the other way around, right? <clears throat> uh, w n m over w m n is rho m over rho n. Then we see that the ratio of the transition probability is e to the minus e n minus e m over k b t. 
<laughs> so now, what is relaxation in this language? Relaxation is, I prepared my system somewhere here, and let's assume that the temperature is very low. Well, the oscillator will most likely go down. It can go up because there is a probability to go up, but if this exponential factor is small, most likely it will go further down, it will go further down all the way until it will be more or less localized in the ground state. This is what relaxation is quantum mechanically. Classically, we describe relaxation by the friction force. Quantum mechanical relaxation is a result of, of the transitions between the levels. And these transitions are mostly in, in one direction. And if temperature is zero, they're just in one direction. And this is what I want to illustrate for you, because this is the next point that I want to make. So. I am erasing this part. We, have, we are done with detailed balance. I want to look at the eigenstates of my oscillator in the rotating frame. And as you remember, I was telling that we have these eigenstates, and there is a stable state in the system. Now I want to understand what the stable state means in terms of the transitions between quasi-energy levels. I look at this expression and I understand a very funny thing. So again, this is the quasi-energy level that corresponds to a stable state. You remember we had this, uh, this line, and they were of amplitude versus field. And I was saying that this is a stable state of the system, of a driven oscillator. Now I have quantized my oscillator. I have this quasi-energy levels. I want to understand what happens with the distribution over these quasi-energy levels in the presence of relaxation. Now, this is a little bit tricky. So please interrupt me if uh, it's incomprehensible, OK? Promise? <laughs> no, you don't promise. <laughs> OK, so I have one-to-one -one correspondence between my Fox states and my oscillator. Relaxation comes not from the driving. Relaxation comes from the coupling of my oscillator to the thermal reservoir. Therefore, relaxation processes, in this case where I, that I consider, when the driving is comparatively weak, you remember that the driving force, the nonlinearity, and the decay were competing with each other, but not with this big frequency, omega f. So my driven oscillator decays in the same way as in the absence of the drive. Did we see any signature of that? In, in our analysis? We did, so, so tell me where. I wrote the equation of motion for the oscillator, right? Classical equation of motion. It had a friction coefficient. Did I say that this friction coefficient changes when I turn on the driving hill? I did not. So I say that relaxation occurs in the same way as without a drive, which means that in terms of Fox states, relaxation still corresponds. I drive my oscillator. But what relaxation means is that an oscillator makes transitions between its states and emits photons. So temperature is zero, it can only emit photons. How 
how is the stationary state formed if it is just emitting photons? How is this state formed? No, no. I'm, I'm talking about relaxation because if, if the relaxation is strong, uh, all the quasi energy levels are, are, are gone and it makes no sense, of course. Um, so, how is the stationary state formed with this finite amplitude? Uh, the dissipation mechan mechanism, of course, does not change if my relaxation is not weak. Dissipation, relaxation, dissipation mechanism remains the same until I make a really strong driving field and my whole dynamics changes. But uh, what, I, what I want to talk about now is the case where the relaxation is comparatively weak. So, again, this picture describe, re refers to this case of weak relaxation. So how, how does it happen that my oscillator is not in the ground state? Well, it happens because I have a drive. Right? So I put energy back from this field cosine omega ft. And this field causes transitions up, essentially. And they are balanced by relaxation processes. And as a result of this balance, there is formed a stationary distribution, a stationary state. This is a stationary state. But now I want to look at it from the point of view of quasi-energy levels. Before, before I do it, let's, let's come back to this, because I know that this is one of the sticking points. So where does relaxation come from? I wrote classical equation of motion plus, plus, and so on. Right? I have this friction coefficient here. Where does it come from microscopically? We have to have something that takes energy from the oscillator some drain for the energy. Where does this drain come from quantum mechanically? It comes from emitting energy, to be specific, photons into the environment. This is the source of this drain. And I, I can write a simple expression for it for a simple model, but let me, let me not do it. Just emission of excitations. You emit excitations. This way you lose energy. This energy loss corresponds to friction in this simple model. The simple Hamiltonian that describes this process is you couple your Hamiltonian to a thermal reservoir, and you consider coupling, which is linear in the operators of the thermal reservoir. So for example, for example, Q sum over K epsilon K bk dagger plus bk, where bk and bk dagger are creation and annihilation operators of photons. This is a specific example. This is a more general form. It can be phonons. It, can be, it doesn't have to be linear. It can be bilinear. Uh, it, it can be more complicated. But this is the microscopic mechanism that underlies the restriction coefficient. So the restriction coefficient can be expressed in terms of the correlation function of uh, these phonons. It's, it's essentially integral dt, e to the i omega naught t, commutator, average value. 
don't want to write it. <laughs> Something like that. Probably imaginary part. Uh, no, real part. <clears throat> Uh, uh, so it's uh, it's proportional. Let me put it proportional. Uh, you can express the friction coefficient in terms of the coupling, but if you look at this and if you write that Q is a plus a dagger square root of h bar over two omega naught or omega f. You see that there are processes A, B, K, dagger, for example, terms like that. What is this process? This is a process which drives your, operator, your oscillator from state n to n minus 1. This is the lowering operator, right? This is a creation operator of your photon. So this is how relaxation comes into play. Relaxation comes into play by emitting excitations into the thermal reservoir. This is where the friction coefficient, this is what defined the friction coefficient that we were having before. So now, uh, this is the picture of relaxation. I emit an excitation from this state. I emit an excitation from this state. I go down, down, down. If there were no drive, I would go down to the ground state. Because the drive is there, I'm brought back into the excited state. And ultimately, there is a balance between emission of excitations into the thermal reservoir and getting energy from the driving field and the stationary distribution is formed. Are you comfortable with this? More or less? It's tricky. You did not think about this uh, in these terms because you were saying, okay, well, there is relaxation, there is drive, and uh, and, uh, and the, the oscillator it's, it's the same for a linear oscillator. And then you have this Lorentzian response for the amplitude of force vibrations, right? What, what is it in terms of quantum mechanics? How does it work in terms of quantum mechanics? Just think about it. If you, if you write equation of motion, q double dot plus 2 gamma q dot plus omega naught squared q linear oscillator is equal to f cosine omega ft. And we know the answer that q is in the stationary regime is a cosine omega ft plus some phase, classically. And you were taught... Uh, uh, today, I think, or yesterday, that it's actually true quantum mechanical for coherent state. You can, uh, you can write the same answer. Uh, what does it mean in terms of the energy levels? What does it mean in terms of the microscopic processes that underlie uh, this solution? There must be some microscopic picture behind. And this is this microscopic picture. Now, what, how does this microscopic picture translate to the quasi-energy states? Well, I have transitions between, between Fox states, but I know that my quasi-energy states are linear combinations of Fox states. Therefore, if there occurs a transition between Fox states, it means that there is also a transition between quasi-energy states. So I start with this quasi-energy state, and as a result of, a, of emission of a photon, I make a transition between quasi-energy states. I can make a transition here, or there, or there, even in this model where transitions between the Fox states are transitions between the nearest levels. 
Why? Because there is a sum here. My quasi-energy state is a superposition of Fock states, and vice versa. My Fock state is a superposition of quasi-energy states. Therefore, a, transitions be a transition between Fox neighboring Fox states corresponds to transitions between several quasi-energy states. But moreover, it's not necessarily transitions down in quasi-energy, right? This is the tricky part. Well, right, right, right. I, 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 I do it. I do it at a, a purely formal level, and what I'm doing is the following. I'm saying that if I have my system prepared in a quasi-energy state. Now I turn on relaxation. If my system is in a quasi-energy state, it is actually in the superposition of Fox states. Right? At the initial moment, at the initial instant of time. Right. I prepare my system in a quasi-energy state initially, and I want to see what happens because of relaxation. Now, relaxation is transitions between Fox states, and all these transitions go in one direction, down. But this transition down, even between neighboring states, correspond because my, my quasi-energy state is a superposition. Even though I make here transitions between neighboring states, in terms of quasi-energy states, I make transitions between remote states as well. And I don't necessarily make transitions down. I also make transitions up. And now we are really confused. I hope we are. Go ahead. Is it safe to say that when you switch uh, between the quality energy states, you're just switching between different coherent states? Uh, I switch between different coherence. I better use Fox states because Fox states, because yeah, the energy states are not necessarily exactly for coherent states. They, are, they they become coherent states only the semi-classical limit. Uh, so they are not they are not exactly coherent states. So I don't want I don't want to mislead you too far. <laughs> I, I'm trying to cheat only a little bit. So, so I have just from this formal picture, what I see is that I make transitions down, but I also can make transitions up. And then, do I have relaxation? How, how is this state formed? What does relaxation mean in these terms. If from any quasi-energy state, my dissipative process leads to transitions up and down, how does the system possibly arrive at a, a stationary state, at the stable state of force vibrations? Well, the answer to this question is that you have to compare the transition probabilities. So suppose I have this state. I will use capital letters for this state, n minus 1, n plus 1, and so on. And I have a probability of transition n to n minus 1. And I have a probability of transition n to n plus 1. What happens is that if the probability of transitions from n to n minus 1 and all the way down, and this is 
up. If my rate down is bigger than the rate up, then the picture is quite clear. I start in this state, for example, and I can make a transition down. So suppose I have made a transition down. I can make a transition up, but more likely I will go further down. Again, from this point I can make a transition up with non-zero probability. But more likely, I will go further down, and further down, and further down. And therefore, in terms of quasi-energies, what happens is that relaxation is the result of the probability of transitions in one direction being higher than the probability of transitions in the opposite direction. And then I made, made a step here. Most likely, I will make a step here again. I can make a step back. But then again, I will most likely step here. And most likely, step, step here. I can make a step back, make, make, can make two steps back. But it's unlikely. Most likely, I will, be, I will keep going, going, going until I fall down. <laughs> so this is what, uh, what uh, relaxation means. Relaxation means that transitions in, in one direction are more probable than in the opposite direction. But the very fact that I can make a transition in the opposite direction has a very profound consequence. It tells me that there is absolutely no way that even where the temperature of my thermal reservoir is zero, I will go down to the lowest quasi-energy state. Here I'm using a jargon, so uh, I just want to be un understood. The meaning, the meaning is that I will necessarily have a finite probability to be in this state, and to be in this state, and to be in this state. That is, I cannot cool the system down to the ground quasi-energy state. No matter what the temperature of my thermal reservoir is. And this effect is called quantum heating. Yes? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. This is, why, this is what I said before when I, say, when I said that I'm, I'm oversimplifying this. There is certainly, in quasi-energy state, there is, absolute, there is actually no up and down. Uh, it's... Uh, it, it depends on what you are talking about, but if I made a plot of this function g as a function of coordinates, this function g in the simplest possible case would look like that. <clears throat> it's actually quite fancy, but the simplest possible case is where this function looks like that. This is the case where there is just one stable state. On this diagram, it corresponds to this region, large, comparatively large fields. And then my eigenvalues are here. And the transitions that I am talking about are transitions between these quasi-energy states. This is the stable state dynamically. Classically, I will come here to this state. Quantum mechanically, I will be in, in, I would think that I would occupy quasi energy state which is closest to this minimum. This is what I do in a system in thermal equilibrium. But what I'm saying is that no, no such luck. I will necessarily 
have a finite probability to occupy this state, and to occupy this state, and to occupy excited states. Even where the temperature of the thermal reservoir is zero. So this is a profound effect of a non-equilibrium system. Being away from equilibrium prevents you from being really cooled down to the ground floquet eigenstate down down to the down to one quasi energy state and there was an experiment which very nicely uh, confirmed this prediction people just measured occupation of the of the lowest occupy low, next to the lowest state here for this oscillator uh, this experiment was done in Saclay. And, uh, and now people are talking about quantum heating due to quantum measurements, which, of course, another, another way of talking about, uh, about coupling to a thermal reservoir and back action from thermal reservoir. Well, yeah. Do you think it would be possible uh, to couple to uh, an optomechanical and then use cyclone cooling to actually force it down to those uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. I don't know how to do it. Let me put it that way. I, uh, <coughs> you, the transition that you make uh, when you couple to any real systems are transitions between, between Fox states. These Fox states, no matter what you do, they are superpositions. Uh, you can cool it down to the ground state, right? But uh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. So this is, I think this is just an unavoidable consequence of the pleasure of having, uh, having quasi-energy states. You cannot, it's very hard to prepare a given quasi-energy state. It can be done, uh, let, me, let me take it back. Uh, if you do it fast, sufficiently fast, so that relaxation doesn't come into play, you can prepare your system in a quasi-energy state. It will stay there for during the lifetime. But it will not be a stationary state. The stationary state is necessarily uh, super, you, you, you find your system in excited quasi-energy states. And this has a profound consequence in a yet another uh, context. So, uh, I have time to 505, right? Okay, fine. Sure. You know you wrote down um, the equation for the change of the population from uh, Fox 8. Right. right. And you said that you get your steady state from when the derivative is zero. Right. Why can't you write that same kind of equation? I can. I can. I can, and, and the equation will have the same form, rho n dot is equal, it's, uh, it will be the same equation. And thank you for the question, it's very much, very much to the point. The equation will be the same, rho n dot is sum w n m rho n with the sign minus, I go from a quasi-energy state and let me use capital. Plus sum w m n rho n. And I can look for the stationary solution of this equation, right? This will give me populations of quasi-energy states, but there is no this condition. There is no detailed balance in this system. Therefore, I, no matter how hard I try, I cannot localize my system in a single state. So this is the difference between a stationary state and the state of detail, with detailed balance. Now, why? I, you, t you remember that I said the detailed balance is a property of systems in thermal equilibrium related to time reversibility. So where did I break time reversibility in my oscillator? Mm -hmm. 
It was a meeting finance anyway. <laughs> what did I change compared to the oscillator which was in thermal equilibrium? It's written, it's written in the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian, does the Hamiltonian have, uh, have uh, time invariance? This Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian of the original system. Of course not. Time has become non-uniform. I have broken time reversibility. My time is now chopped into portions. Here force goes up, here force goes down, here force goes up, here force goes down. It's no longer a uniform time. And this is, this is why I lose detailed balance. And this is why the solution of this equation is, does not satisfy this condition for detailed balance. It's stationary. This, this sum is equal to this sum. But not each condition, not each transition is balanced. Detailed balance, thermal equilibrium, is a very delicate and very actually restrictive and amazing condition. Each transition is balanced. If I make a step to the right, I know that I will have to make the step to the left with absolutely certain probability. In the stationary regime, I can go several times right and then several times left, or Three, three steps right, three steps left, or five steps right, uh, four steps left, and then maybe another step, step left. Uh, on average, I, my population does not change. But not each transition is balanced. Because my time is, my time reversibility is broken. Yeah? But you didn't get why the periodic population time No, 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 of course not. Of course not. Think about, think about what happens when I consider this approaching thermal equilibrium. I couple my system to a thermal reservoir, right? Now, I pump energy into my oscillator. This energy is dumped into thermal reservoir. There is an energy flux into thermal reservoir. If I inverse time, there will be energy flux into my oscillator from thermal reservoir? I don't think so. My field breaks time reversibility. I have dissipation of energy from the field. The oscillator takes energy from the field and dumps it into thermal reservoir. And there is a flux on average, a non-zero energy flux from my oscillator into thermal reservoir. Once you have a flux, you don't have time reversibility because time reversibility would change the sign of this flux. Do you agree with this? Yeah, you'd better. Well, well, these things are very confusing. I can tell you, these things are very confusing, and it requires it requires thinking. But the idea of this is very, very straightforward. Once you have a flux. It means that if you reverse time, the flux would go in the opposite direction. But you have flux only in one direction. You have energy dissipated into thermal reservoir, not the other way around. So, uh, let me try. 
let me try to tell you a um, more recent story related to this business and related to the driven systems. And this story is kind of entertaining. So you all know the EPR paradox, right? And the EPR paradox was a mistake made by a great man, which turned out to be very stimulating. Uh, recently, there was another mistake made by, by an outstanding physicist, which turned out to be very stimulating. And I just want to tell you about this mistake and how it is related to nanomechanics and things like that. <clears throat> so the mistake was called time crystals. And the person who made this mistake is Frank Wilczek. Uh, and if you know uh, the Earth Combination Standard Model, you should also know the name Wilczek. So Wilczek said that uh, if atoms can arrange themselves into a lattice, why wouldn't we have a lattice in time? Why wouldn't we have the ground state of a quantum system periodic in time? So this was done, we'll check. I'm, I misspell, I'm sorry. Uh, there is Z. Something like that. No? I, like that? Yeah, so it's we'll check uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, three years later, there was published a paper which explained that, no, 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 this is not happening in systems in thermal equilibrium. And again, this is related to what we were just saying, that in thermal equilibrium, there is no time direction. All time, time is uniform. So this is the definition of thermal equilibrium. So in thermal equilibrium, you may not possibly have a time crystal. Uh, then uh, there was a parallel development which started actually a year, late, uh, an, a year earlier and which was related to periodically modulated systems. The question was uh, the following. Suppose I have a system which is periodically modulated like this. What is the expectation value of my operator in the quasi-energy state? So the expectation value is psi epsilon <laughs> of t. Some operator L doesn't matter what it is, psi epsilon of t. Let me now calculate it at time t plus tf. I know this factor of the wave function, right? Now, calculate it in your head. What is the answer? It's the first line, right? Because I have here, this is e to the, this is complex conjugate, so this is e to the i epsilon tf over h bar psi epsilon of t l e to the minus i epsilon t f over h bar psi epsilon of t which is equal to this right so what it means is that any observable quantity in a quasi energy state oscillates with the period of the drive nice and then uh, there was a paper that said, and then the experiment that uh, independently done, uh, kind of observed 
is the phenomenon of period doubling. That is, you have this prime operator L, you look at the system and the observation and the expectation value of this operator oscillates with period doubling with period 2 TF. How does it happen? Well, let's say that I have <coughs> I have a state phi of T which is A1 psi epsilon 1 of T plus A2 psi epsilon 2 of T. And now I want to calculate the expectation value of my operator L in this state. I prepare the coherence superposition. Right? So I will have, of course, the diagonal terms, right? So I will have A1 squared psi 1 L of T. Let me write it carefully. Psi 1 of T L psi 1 of T plus A2 squared psi 1 psi, psi 2 psi, psi 2 of T L psi 2 of T and to make it meaningful I will take phi of T plus T F sorry So this is from the diagonal terms. And we know that for diagonal terms, uh, there is no time-dependent factor here, right? This is just the matrix element which calculated. But then there is something weird, because then there is this term, A1, A2, e to the i epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 tf over h bar phi psi 1 of t l psi 2 of t plus complex conjugate. Well, tough luck. Nothing special, right? Except, except for the case where epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 is pi h bar over tf. That is, the difference of the quasi-energies is half the modulation period, uh, half, the, half the energy h bar omega f. If this is pi h bar over tf for some reason, then this factor becomes e to the i pi. And so the expectation value is not periodic. But if I calculate this expectation value at time 2 tf, if I put 2TF here, this will not change. Here I will have 2TF and it will be e to the i 2 pi. Therefore, my expectation value in a superposition of two states that differ in quasi-energy by half of the quasi-energy bandwidth, h bar omega f, I can create expectation values in the states that will be periodic with period 2. We'll get to it, probably. <laughs> Over coffee. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> so, how does it, how can it possibly happen that you have uh, this relation uh, applied? Well, uh, the papers that 
where uh, uh, one paper was uh, about cold atoms, uh, Fermi atoms in bosonic reservoir, or vice versa, bosonic atoms in Fermi, Fermi atom reservoir, uh, by Zoller, uh, Gil Raphael, and, uh, and several other authors in 2011. Uh, all these references are in this file that I put on, on, the, on the internet. So you can find all these references. And I put uh, these references with the titles of the paper so you can see what, how the paper was, what the title was. Right? Uh, uh, and uh, the states that were found there, we, we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand what it was. But ultimately, this were a state where there were two Majorana fermions at the, at the edges. And these two Majoranas uh, had difference of why the energy exactly like that. And then there was, in 2012, uh, there was an experiment and the first author on this paper is Kitagawa. Uh, the experiment where essentially time periodic uh, time periodicity was mimicked by uh, a set of polarizers, and the photon was propagating through this set of polarizers. And in this system, there also emerge a couple of boundary states, which have exactly this condition. And they have seen this period doubling in, uh, this, uh, in this chain. So this boundary state had period 2. So period 2 means that it's 2TF. The periodicity of the system is TF. However, you don't come back after one period. Do you know any example where you don't come back after one period? Spin, right. Spin one half is, is an example like that. So here is a time analog of spin one half, if you like. Right. Um, well, long and behold, last year, uh, there was, actually the first paper was on the archive in 2015, uh, by Sonhe and his group. Uh, and uh, this year, you could find in all uh, popular journals, from Wall Street Journal to, to go down, down the line to nature, that there is a new state of matter where you drive your system, and this system displays period doubling. And the theory was done for a spin chain. The experiments, there were two experimental results uh, done with an interval of about one week. And one of the people on the both papers, both papers have the same courses, although the systems, uh, the systems are completely different. One experiment was done with, um, uh, with cold ions in Monroe Group at Maryland. Uh, the other was done with uh, uh, NV centers in Diamond uh, in, Lukens, in Lukens group. And in both groups, uh, they saw that when they drive the system by a specifically designed sequence of pulses, they, can, they could see period doubling. And Lukin even saw period tripling. Now, do you know of any system that you know that displays period doubling? You know such systems. Trivial. Totally trivial. What about parametric oscillator? What do you do with a parametric oscillator? Imagine that you are, this is, this is how I usually describe it. Uh, you are on swings. And you do squats to make them go. Right? By the way, apparently, ancient Greeks had swings already. Uh, on some bases, there are, there are pictures of swings. Um, so you do these squats, 
and you count one forward, two backward, three forward, four backward, five forward, six backward, all odd forward, all, all uh, even backward. What is the relation between the period of your vibrations and the period of squats? Two squats per vibration period. This is called period doubling. Now, you necessarily have two states, because we had all odd forward and even backward, but you could as well have all odd backward and even forward. So you have two states, but you are in one of them. And this system is, of course, your swings are a pretty classical system, very, very dissipative system. So it is different from the statement of, uh, of the new state of matter which displays period doubling in the quantum coherence regime. The question is how to link these two cases. And essentially, a nonlinear oscillator provides a very natural way to linking period doubling in a quantum coherence system and see how what happens when you switch to incoherent regime. And the question number one is, can you have period doubling in a parametric oscillator in the quantum coherent regime? So no dissipation. Can you have your parametric oscillator that will be in a state that displays period doubling? The answer is yes, but it's a non-trivial, it's a non-trivial statement. So <laughs> if you are prepared to listen for another 15 minutes how to do it, I will, I will tell you how to do it. If you are that tired, I can stop here. It's a yes or no question. Let's take a vote. <laughs> Well, those who don't, those who, those who are not interested, I just, just, just leave and, or, or check your email, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> let me, let me try to show you what happens here. So, First of all, what is the Hamiltonian of my driven oscillator, parametrically driven oscillator, in the real Hamiltonian? It's one half Q squared, except that delta omega is now one half omega f minus omega naught. That is, I drive my oscillator, I modulate the frequency, look at these terms. This is Q squared and this is Q squared. Now, my omega naught squared has become omega naught squared plus f cosine omega ft. That is, I modulate the frequency. Is it related to what I'm doing on swings? What do I do when I do a squat on, on swings? What do I change? The length. What is uh, does uh, the frequency of a uh, pendulum depend on the length? It does. So when I'm doing squatting, I'm changing the, I'm modulating the frequency of the swings, and this is how I excite them. So swings are a parametric oscillator. <clears throat> so I drive it close to a resonance. In this case, it's one half omega f is close to omega naught. And if I do the system classically, exactly as I did before, I will find that my oscillator can have two states with uh, two stationary states, A cosine one half omega f t plus pi, one state, 
In second state, A cosine one half omega f t plus pi plus pi. They are just shifted in phase by pi, as are these this, this vibrations on swings. They are shifted in phase by pi, by even at odd difference phase just by pi, right? You don't see it? Here is the vibration, one vibration, another vibration. And here is my modulation frequency. Huh? Let me try to see it. So this is f cosine omega f t. And these are two vibrations, one this and the other. A, uh, this is number one, and this is number two. Now, in the notes, I describe a much more interesting and more sophisticated case of period tripling, uh, but uh, it's, it's not something I can describe in, in, in a fast way. So let's think about what happens with these period two vibrations. These are two states of the oscillator, which are identical. It reminds you a particle in a double well potential, in a symmetric double well potential. Here there are also two states which are identical, just shifted in sign, have opposite sign. So believe me or not, I can go through the same calculation that I did here, and I will obtain my function g which will look almost like that. Uh, it will have a form plus one half one minus mu p squared minus one half one plus mu q squared and mu, mu is proportional to this delta omega. And if you see, if you look at this now, Hamiltonian in the rotating frame, if I look at it at p equal to zero, at p equal to zero, it becomes one quarter q to the fourth minus one half one plus nu q squared, right? So if I plot this function g of p equals to zero q like that, this is the potential that I will have. Again, I cannot separate kinetic and potential energy, so what I'm saying now is a cartoon. So now, again, I have eigenvalues of this operator G and eigenfunctions. So what do you know about eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of a particle in a symmetric potential world? If I change q to the minus q, I have the same function, the same Hamiltonian. So my eigenfunctions have to be either even or odd. Does it ring the bell? Not every bell. <laughs> So I have an even state plus and anti-symmetric state. So state minus psi minus of q is minus psi minus of minus q. And psi plus of q is psi plus of minus q. Which you can guess from here. If I change the sign of q, my function g does not change. Therefore, my change of sign should, my eigenfunction should be an eigenfunction of the operator of, of sign change. And this is either even or odd. And now, if I am in any of this, of the corresponding quasi-energy state, 
what is my period for each of these states? It's period one. It's period one, because after period one, I come back to that same state. The only option for me to have period doubling is where these two states coincide, have the same eigenvalues gm. And have you ever heard about level repulsion, anti-crossing, any of these words, right? So levels anti-cross, they don't cross. They, they don't like to coincide. Well, this is, uh, this is our mentality based on, uh, on the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy. And actually, Hilbert's theorem related, was related to the Hamiltonian of the 4p squared over 2 plus potential energy. So this uh, anti-crossing is kind of an artifact of simple Hamiltonian. For more complicated Hamiltonians, like we have here, this symmetric and anti-symmetric state can have the same eigenvalue g. And there is no way that I can show you how it works. But you can read about it. But the amazing part is that, yes, the eigenvalues can coincide. And when they coincide, this is exactly that situation of quasi-energy levels different by half, half the energy h bar omega f. So with a parametric oscillator, we can naturally have a quantum coherent regime where oscillate, where expectations values are have periods too. But now we know what happens when we turn on dissipation in this system. Because when we turn on dissipation, ultimately, we end up on swings, right? And on swings, we vibrate with a certain phase, which has periods too. And so you can carefully see how by turning on dissipation, you switch from this period doubling in the coherence regime, where these two states coincide, to period doubling, which is fully incoherent. So nanomechanics provides you with this sweet opportunity of connecting uh, quantum coherent and quantum incoherent period doubling. And it also allows you to study period tripling, uh, which is a far more interesting phenomenon with different phenomenology and different properties. And, uh, and this is one of the games nanomechanics allows you to play. Thank you very much. <laughs>